My name's Nicola, I'm, I'm from the University of Salford and I think there's quite a mix of academic staff and librarians in the room and I know that many of the librarians may have listened to me talk at Biol at the conference last June. Can I just see who was at the conference last June? All right, a few of you, okay. <laughs> so what I'm going to be talking about is what's happened at Salford over the last few years in terms of our legal research training. We've been on quite a different path since about 2011, and so we've been using flipping the classroom as a training method um, for legal research in particular. And at Biol, I did a talk about what flipping the classroom is, the history of it, why it was good, why it wasn't good. Uh, but I was talking to a very different audience. I was talking to commercial librarians, and I was talking to academic librarians. So I feel that if I'd have just spoken to the academic librarians, then this was probably would have been the presentation that I'd have done. Uh, in bio last year. So for those of you who have heard me talk before, I hope that it is still interesting and you still, there's still something uh, from this. Um, and I think somebody made the point earlier that not everything fits into every place. Um, this is something that we found at Salford has worked for us. And I know that uh, in terms of trying to, to flip the classroom, if it's something you've not heard about, I will tell you what that actually is in a moment. Uh, might not fit anywhere. But what I want to talk to you about is what we've learned and what we've found has helped us do this and how um, the department and I have worked together uh, in, to do, in order to do this. And I would have loved for the academic who is involved in the model that I teach on to be with me to be able to talk about her side today. But for reasons that will become clear later on, um, she isn't here. Uh, but I will talk about that a little bit more in depth. Have I gone the wrong way? That way, right. Here is some of our lovely law students looking particularly attentive. This is our first year cohort from around 2011. Um, and in 2011, I was working on a module called Analytical Research Skills. And um, it does have a very unfortunate acronym of Analytical Research Skills. I will refer to it as ARS. Um, so I apologise now if I accidentally slip into how I would talk about if I was in a departmental meeting. What this module intended to do is to equip students with all the necessary critical thinking, research skills and study skills that they would need throughout their degree. It runs in the first year, in the first um, semester, as many of our, our modules do, and it's made up of this analytical research skills which has assessment in it, and then it has a communications module which runs on from that, of which they learn their mooting skills, um, but they are treated as two separate things. Now I am embedded in this module, I am part of the teaching team for this module, and I work on the assessment as well. And when I was trying to write this presentation, I was thinking, well, why did that happen? Was there something that I did? And I think I was in a very fortunate position that Salford Law School is very young, it only opened in 2006. So all the staff, when we started, came from different places. There was no history of doing anything, no custom and practice. And we were able to really throw everything onto the table and try and take all the best practice that we had done at our other institutions and try and pull that together. So I'd love to be able to give some inspiring words about how to get into work with the department if you're not embedded as much as you would like. But unfortunately, I don't. I think it was luck and... Also, I think I did go into um, Salford and sort of explain what I had done in other places. And I probably badgered them a little bit and said, this is what I want to do, this is what, how I want to get involved. Um, and they, they let me, maybe to shut me up, I don't know. So these are the law students and they are looking very engaged and I'd just like you to you know, keep them in mind as we go through the next few slides. So prior to September 2012, when everything changed, on paper, the... Work we did with legal research training looked great. We had nine hours of teaching, all of which are highlighted on the board behind me. There's a lot of text, but my bits are in, highlighted in red. And this was for me to come in and deliver the legal research skills training. Six of those hours, however, were based in a lecture room. I'm trying to teach a practical skills session in a lecture room. It isn't practical. The audience experience was really passive. The training mostly consisted of me standing up and doing how-to demonstrations. I'd try and make it interactive and answer have questions and I'd just be met with blank faces. Um, you know, they had to listen to me demonstrate databases, PowerPoint explanations of search strategies, Boolean logic, using a scale of how to reference a book. I mean, it, it, was, it was a bit boring for me, so 
the poor students. Then they got three hands-on hours, so they would come in, and they're the ones on the seminars there. So finding the law one, finding the law two, and legal research skills in practice, and they actually came to the seminar room for those. And again, they're 50-minute sessions, these ones. The reason they're repeated twice at a seminar cycle at the University of Salford is two weeks. Um, now, we are a small school. There is only 130 on our intake. Uh, currently, it was less then. So I did have to repeat each session four or five times. Um, but uh, to smaller numbers, it was slightly more manageable to do that. But often in the practical sessions, they would just follow me. They would just replicate the searches that I was doing on automatic. They just followed the instructions I'd written down on my sheet. What was happening was when they then left and went into their other core modules in their first year, they weren't transferring these searching skills in order to be able to find that information for contract law and criminal law. <coughs> so something had to change. So remember the attentive students, this is what my students look like, and this was the ones who actually turned up. Um, from 100, 120 students that we had, I would say 10 or 15 would come to each lecture, which is, is shockingly poor, given that this is meant to teach the students everything that they know, need to know in order to complete their degree and find information and make their lives easier, really, in terms of, of research. So there was a massive chunk of students missing this important information about finding quality resources. And they just went back to using Google. Um, Wikipedia turned up a lot in the references, much to the academic and um, members of staff distress. So at the time, the module leader of analytical research skills uh, was a lady called Chris McCloyd. And I went to her in 2012 and spoke to her and said, I'm not very happy with the way these sessions are going. We're getting really poor student feedback. The students aren't engaging. The standard of referencing is really poor. Um, so we got our heads together uh, over a coffee and we decided that something did need to change. And she said, well, you're the expert. Go away and have a think about how you want to do it. And pretend that we've got nothing to work from and we'll restart to go from scratch. Because we'd always known it was poor and we tried to change it every year to do something a little bit differently, try and throw up a little bit more interactiveness, a new session, an old session, take a session away. But she said, let's clear the slate and let's start again. So that's when I came to flipping the classroom. <laughs> Um, no, I actually was alerted to flipping to the classroom uh, by my husband, who's an IT manager, and he said he'd been looking at the Khan Academy website. Has anybody ever looked at the Khan Academy website? Yes, you really have. What you would find when you go on there is a series of short, two or three minute long videos. It's an American website, and it's aimed mostly at primary school teachers. Oh, that's what it was when it started, when I looked at it uh, a few years ago. And it's short bits of content on how to do stuff aimed at primary school teacher uh, uh, students, like how to um, do addition, subtraction, fractions, equations, maybe perform a little science experiment, how a water cycle works, just these little snippets of content. And the aim was that teachers could put these bits of content online on their, um, on their school virtual learning environment. So the student would look at that piece of content, learn what it was, the facts about it, and then come into the classroom and do some activities based on what they learned. So it was the idea of flipping the classroom on its head that the, the, the how-to learning that the teacher would have normally have stood at the front and imparted, the students did at home, and what they would have done for homework and the activities and trying to put that learning to practice, they did in the classroom with the teacher on hand to help guide them through. Um, there was a guy who did a conference paper in about 2000 called Jay Wesley Bank, and, it's called, uh, and he did a, a conference paper called The Classroom Flip. And he first used the phrase, flipping the classroom. And in that, he talked about the teacher or the trainer becoming the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. And I have heard it certainly felt like the sage on the stage over the years. Um, so, simplified ex explanation is students learn how to do something before they come to the classroom, and then when they're in the classroom, it's all activity-based and problem-based learning. So that's what we tried to do. This slide just summarises what I just said there. Chris and I felt that for legal research skills, that element of the analytical research module, we thought we could try this and see what happened. So we decided to stop delivering the passive sessions where I just talked to the students about how to use the databases and why it was important. And what I did was I put that content online. So the students would then be expected to look at the how to do something content before they came into the classroom. So that might be how to find a book on the library catalogue or how to reference a book using a scholar. 
Um, but I wouldn't then spend the time in the classroom going over it. So from 2012, in September, this was our revised schedule for analytical and research skills module. So I've got, even though it still looks a lot of red, I actually only had four hours of contact time with the students. I had one lecture in the second week, and then three seminars. But there was a new column, this one with the BBM, it stands for Blackboard Learning Module. And I put some online learning content that the students were expected to look at before they came to the classroom online. And these learning modules were released around the time that they were meant to do it. So they didn't get access to everything at once. It was drip feeding it through the first semester so they weren't overwhelmed with the content. Um, so they would then look at the Blackboard Learning Module 1 and then they'd come to their seminar on finding the law. And then the seminar was, was really practical. Within this as well, I mentioned that we did assessments. In week six, they had to submit uh, an assessment which was based on what they had done in finding the law one. And that was all about paper-based resources in the library, navigating the library, hard copy resources. And this is an online quiz that they do on Blackboard, so it was automatically marked. Then in week, just after the winter vacation, actually, of course, we're on submission, to come from there quite nicely, they would have to submit a copy of the uh, Lexus certificate and also the Westlaw certificate. So at some point in that first term, they had to have gone on and done the research certificate exercises set by those companies. And all they had to send in was a scanned copy of their certificate to prove that they'd done it. They had to um, also submit um, a research trail and a bibliography reference to a scholar style of sources that they had referred to. So they didn't have to answer any questions really, and didn't have to go write an essay, it was just 500 words about how they'd undertaken the research process, and then done a bibliography as well, so testing all those skills. This is what we actually covered in each of the sessions that I delivered. So I delivered the lecture two, and then some seminars, so they weren't all, I didn't do a big block of teaching as I said, it was throughout the first uh, term. And so before week two, when they came to the lecture, they were instructed to watch three short videos on defining and understanding the topic, keywords and phrases, search strategies, search tips, and an overview of what kind of resources were available for them to look at. Each video was a maximum of four minutes long. Um, I didn't have to recreate much content because I already had this material in PowerPoint, so I just screencast it one afternoon, broke it down into small chunks, screencast it, or put it up on the BLA. So it wasn't very professional. I used free software, I used Jig, but it, it was done and dusted and it was on there. So then when they came into the uh, lecture, I went in with just four slides, which as a librarian who's always been used to going in with reams and reams of material was a very nerve wracking experience, thinking, well, what happens if the students don't? take part. I mean, I've tried to ask a question in a lecture room before and they've not responded to me and I thought, what if that happens? Well, I thought, it, it can't really get worse than what it has been if more than 15 turn up, I'm on a winner. Um, so the idea of the session is that they then get the opportunity to ask questions on their learning content that they've done before they come in and then put those skills into place uh, and have a practice with them. My fears were confirmed the first time I did this, and I said, anybody got any questions on the pre-learning content? Nothing. Not one question came forward. So at that point, I very quickly put on the research problem on the screen and said, oh, ask me if anything comes up. Put this on the screen. They were given five minutes to work in groups to define the topic and pull out keywords and phrases. Um, now, some students had done the preparation, and I found that those students who hadn't able to sit with their peers and take part in the discussion, uh, even though they hadn't done the preparation themselves. And then after that they'd done that, I gave them a mind map that they could fill out if they wanted to. After they did that, I asked for some of the uh, more confident groups if somebody would come down and put that up on the visualiser. And the students fed in things that they'd come up with differently. And to my amazement, they did. Uh, they did engage with it. I can't explain why they did, whether it's because they knew what they were to be expected of them before they came to the session because they got an understanding of the topic, they'd been able to talk to their friends about it before starting, they just felt that little bit more confidence. So they did that, then we moved on to creating search strings for the research problem and then we looked at how to plan a search and each time there was a short discussion afterwards. 
And just very briefly, so sort of after they'd done that, this set the scene for the practical seminars. They then came in uh, to do a library treasure hunt, and this was based all on using houseless laws, finding cases, law enforcing hard copy, finding legislation in hard copy. And I just gathered them in a room to start with, asked them if there was any questions, because they should have watched the videos on all these resources before they came in. And then I let them loose. And you could tell the ones who'd done the preparation, because they were done in 20 minutes, and said, is that it? Can we go? <laughs> and the other ones were the ones who were struggling. But because I was in, able to spend the time with them, with the resources in the hands, they left the session more confident. But the other thing was, they also didn't like the idea that some people could do it and they couldn't. So they said they'd prepare more for the next few sessions. And I, and I do believe that they did. Uh, in the e-resource session, we went back to the problem-based scenario of that research problem. And I just set them loose and said, go and find information. Didn't tell them where to look, because they should have watched the videos on using Westworld access using our discovery service. Um, and then we had a discussion at the end about how they got on. And there was always a group of students who went off and used Google. But then, actually in the session, I remember one lad in particular saying to his mate, how did you get that? What are you on there? And he was on Westworld. And he said, I don't use Google, mate. You'll get on here much quicker. And he went off and did it. So rather than me as a librarian standing there and saying, go and use Westport or go and use Lexus, he learned it off his friend and he seemed to stick. And then finally, the referencing one, um, rather than doing the how to's, I got them into the room and we set up a speed referencing event. Time to make referencing a <laughs> We had a bell and they had these workstations and they had to go around and uh, cite a book, a journal, a case, legislation, and there were six ones and I rang the bell and they had to move on and we got to the end and, and so they, they, they engaged far more than we started with the PowerPoint. Um, I'd say the students, I, um, they did engage with it, um, about 70% of them did prepare for the first lecture and then each session it both went about how many did actually prepare because they said they didn't like the feeling of being left behind. Um, attendance at my analytical research sessions for legal research went from 10 to 15 people to over 91% for all my library-based sessions, which was phenomenal in the history of research, legal research and solved them. And the academic staff also commented that they were finding the students were using a more wide range of resources, <coughs> that the references that Wikipedia had diminished quite a lot. And the standard of the scholar referencing for the first years was far higher than they'd ever seen in the six or seven years that they'd been over, which was great. And one of the things I've got asked over the last few years is why did it work? And some people have tried to do it and then maybe it's not been so successful. And the main reason though, that I can think that it has worked is because it was delivered in a partnership between myself and so not only was it the relationship with Chris, who she was willing to let me go away and do this and completely change the way we did the legal research side, it was the involvement of the other core module staff, because all of those scenarios I've talked about, all the research problems I've done, were things that the students were doing in their core modules at that same time. So the public law, the research problem in the lecture was the public law, uh, one that they were to be preparing for their seminar the following week for public law. So not only, were they seeing that they were getting something that would help them in their core modules? The academic staff of those modules, those module leaders, were also promoting the sessions to the students to say, go along, it's going to help you, it's going to save you energy, it's going to save you time, and it's going to show you how you get hold of this stuff. So they, they had a buy-in already to why these sessions were going to be useful. Um, I remember once in the, um, in the paper-based exercise one, I got them to find an article from the Cambridge Law Journal, which they needed. Um, for contract law the following week, I think. And she, the student came up to me and went, I've been trying for days and now I've got it in my hands. And she went away so happy. And some of the feedback from the students was that, you know, they felt like they could just have a go and find information for their other subjects now. Uh, but it was that promotion by the academic staff and the module and the skills that they were able to give it an academic context, which I, as a librarian, wasn't able to do. And I think it's been mentioned a few times today that Sometimes students look at a library and think, well, why are you telling me? What do you know? But if the information comes from the academic or is supported by the academic teaching staff, it gives it an, an, um, an authority, if you like, and then they will <coughs> engage far more. Now, Chris and I, as I say, we work together on this. This is Chris and I in partnership as chain. Um, and what we did was the first lecture 
that we had analytical research skills were just an introduction one. And I was invited along to that. Chris did most of the talk, she led on that session. Um, but we talked about how this model was going to be taught, how they would be expected to prepare for their sessions, just like they would for any other seminar that they'd be attending, um, and that they would be expected to participate. And then I came in and showed them where all the stuff was. But again, it was give Chris taking the lead on that, even though it was my information, it's a bit like you were saying, it's the invisible librarian. I sort of stood in the background, even though Chris was saying what I had told her to say, but it came from Chris. Um, so um, <coughs> the students, um, did engage with them until a few sessions time when they kind of realised that actually this may be useful and then they would listen to me then rather than needing, needing a, a, a leader. Chris also came along to the lecture that I did um, and again we worked in, in it as a team as part of that so the students saw us together and it enabled me to sort of talk about the practical side of things but Chris could then give it this academic context um, which was invaluable. But we've had a few problems. That was 2012 and that was brilliant. 2013 was not quite so successful um, because in July 2013, Salford Law School actually closed and we were told we weren't going to be running law at Salford uh, anymore. Luckily, a few weeks later, this decision was reversed. Uh, although Salford Law School still closed, we became Salford Law at Salford Business School and the unit moved to it in Salford. However, this only happened after our academic staff went from 13 to 6, um, because people had gone out to so many positions. And um, one of those was Chris, and she was such a vital key to the success of analytical research skills. Um, and the other members of staff were given modules with four or five weeks to go before the students arrived. Uh, analytical research skills were thrown out to, to another uh, academic member of staff. They had to get to grips with not only their new subjects that they, they were going to do, but also with all these other modules, which between five of them they had to teach three years of students, which was an incredible thing. And as you can imagine, an innovative life training was very low on the list of priorities. I did, however, get a lovely lecture, it was called Laura. And um, Laura is um, an expert in legal skills. And she's a, a, a massive pro library champion, which really helps. So she did, did as much as we were able to do. We weren't able to get the um, module content to use as examples. The module leaders who took over the new modules weren't as on board with the process because they didn't understand, we hadn't been able to market it to them. Um, so they weren't involved as much as with the promotion um, of what we did. And we didn't achieve the same success that we did in 2012, in 2013. We know why that, that is. The students still did participate. They were still far more engaged in sessions than we done prior to 2011. Uh, but probably only around 50 to 60 percent of students would actually prepare before they came. Uh, and a few more how-to demonstrations and explanations had to creep in because obviously they hadn't done the content. But <laughs> the content still being available was really valuable because students went back and looked at it retrospectively. And I was also able to refer them to the online content. <coughs> So looking to the future, um, things will change once again. I did hope that this year I'd be able to redo a 2012 in September 14, but that's not going to happen because we are now having a completely new overhaul LLB degree, of which there is no timetable space for skills teaching. So I feel like I've gone from this giddy height of success to where do I go from here? Um, one of the pluses is that the staff who are there are really on board. They still see skills as important, but because the new degree has some more business options in it, there's not the space to put, uh, because we're now part of business school, to put in these skills. Um, so what we're looking at doing is they will get training at the point of need that they need it. So like an English, English, English legal process, they'll need to find a case. So that week, that video will be heavily promoted. This is how you find a case, but it's, I'm going to go, I'm going to be an invisible librarian. It's not going to be me, it'll be my content. But not me standing up for the students. They won't know who I am, other than a short hello, like induction, five minute speech. Um, so the future is, is unknown. I do have some concerns, but I, we are looking at trying to make some kind of standalone, although voluntary, not embedded module that if we can build on the promotion that the academic staff were involved in in 2012, maybe link it to some of our um, 
we've got this offered advantage award for students. They actually give students uh, some carrots for actually taking this to try and see if we can get them involved in doing some more in-depth research. Because obviously just knowing how to find a case doesn't explain what legal research is. So the future is, is open. Uh, I have a meeting next week to find out where we're going to go from here. Um, and hopefully, you know, if people understand, I might be back to say we found success in another area. But for now, we'll wait and see. If you'd like to know more about flipping the classroom, what it is, the uh, benefits and drawbacks of it, there is an article in the Media Information Management for uh, November, uh, December, sorry, uh, 2013, a small plug there for my article. You know, please have a look at that or if you want to ask any questions, then you can do that. Or contact me at another time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can I just ask, what did you think of the quality of the work? <coughs> the quality of the work is unmarked. Yeah. Um, I have to confess that, unlike Emily, I'm not actually involved in marking the research trail. Right. I'm involved in organising the online tests. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the, I do look at the bibliographies, and I'm also um, involved in collating the research certificates. <coughs> data looking at previous years, first year references compared to first year references for 2012. I haven't finished that study yet, so I hope to by April to actually see if, what's the um, verbal comments from the academic staff, whether there's actually anything behind that fact at all. <laughs> it just seems extraordinary to me that they closed John Wall School when every other Wall School is expanding exponentially. Why is this doing that? Salford University went through a massive restructure. Mm. Um, and many of our programs, history, languages, were uh, removed. Um, lots of departmental restructures, 500 staff were, um, were lost. And it was one of those schools that I think was seen as small, and uh, maybe didn't bring me in better or something. But it's 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 uh, luckily they they brought it back, and I think I'm very pleased that they have. And in fact, this year when we took our students, we took more students than we ever have. Mm -hmm. So I think the future is bright for Law and Salford, or Salford Law as we are now known, um, and then. Hopefully, a bright future for legal research as well, but in a completely new capacity. I have to go away and do some research. <laughs> but there's not fear for you because it's such a lost opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because if you were starting a law degree now, to embed skills actually in all the, instead of having separate skills courses, to have them embedded in every subject. Yeah. You have the opportunity to do that yes. because, in fact, the desire is not on their separate skills course. <coughs> yes. But the answer to that is not to do no skills. <laughs> the yes. answer to that is to get them into those sessions. But of course, academics are so wedded to their subject they don't want to be teaching skills. <coughs> I'm teaching skills. <laughs> but again, looking at that, because we're currently five members of staff and waiting for the new members of staff to start, when they do, hopefully, them um, might. The, Again, no preconceived ideas of how things have been done. Maybe it's that clean state that we started with in 2006 and the opportunity to get into the core modules and say, yes, put the how to find stuff for that module in there at a time when the students need it, but try and get involved with the assessment and say them the meeting next week. And I'm so glad that I've been able to come to them and listen to all these comments and stories of what other people do. I feel so much more confident about the meeting next week you know, ideas and, and you know, reasons for setting why we need this. Mm. Um, so yeah, it has really helped me. Because mm. we all feel things. What, what was the thinking behind that? Because I mean, nearly every law school has an equal skills course. You know, we all, I mean, we sort of have our concerns about, as you say, this sort of bolt on equal skills that then this will be transferable. And, but what was the, because it's so common to have an equal skills course, why, why did they decide not to? Have an equal skills or equal method? I don't Do you know. know what I wasn't involved in the discussion right. with that to say mm -hmm. um, the new degree was launched as part of the new software business school. So is it a business based NLP? It is, it's going to be more of a corporate based NLP than mm -hmm. the, the generic one we've had in the 
past. Um, so sort of English legal process, for example, which would have been talked about a whole year ago and sort of only into the first three weeks, three months. Um, so there's, there's going to be lots of modules that have been changed around. And I suppose, I think, we may fit in quite well in the legal process. We might be able to do quite a lot of skills in there. But it's three months to do what would normally have been done in a year. Forgive me, because I've not read your article. Your, your success with the flip with the 120, do you think you could replicate that with 400? I would need more help. Uh, I couldn't do it solely by myself. Um, but in fact, I didn't deliver all the seminar sessions myself this year because I, I should have said I also work, I only work part time, so I'm only have 130 students, but I only work a couple of days a week. Um, so one of my colleagues actually stepped in and because she, she came along to my sessions before and sort of learned from that. So I think you, you definitely need support in order to deliver the hands-on sessions, and even in the lecture, because with 100 students, between myself and Chris, we were tired by the end of that lecture, because we were going around and helping the groups. If you had 400, you would need a few helpers. 